The war at sea between 1914 and 1918 was mainly between two great fleets, Britain's Royal Navy and the new battleships saw little action. In January 1915, however, there was a serious clash in the North Sea off the Dogger Bank. British naval intelligence intercepted German radio signals. In 1916, Admiral Hipper sailed into the North Sea with five battlecruisers, heading a fleet of 16 modern battleships. Their purpose? To draw the Royal Navy out of their base in England. Initially, the plan worked. British losses were far higher, in fact, than that of the Imperial Navy. Germany would never risk her fleet in open conflict for the rest of the war. In 1918, with the war lost, the German high seas fleet sailed into the British base at Scarpa Flow in the Orkneys to surrender. The ships were impounded, but the German Imperial Navy was to deliver its final blow to the British. They scuttled the entire fleet of battleships, battle cruisers, and destroyers. Admiral von Reuter's decision to scuttle the fleet cost Germany its battleships, but the success of the operation served to take the sting out of the peace treaty when it was signed a week later at the Palace of Versailles. Part of the treaty stipulated that Germany had to give up her battleships and cruisers. Thanks to von Reuter, however, the majority of that fleet were destroyed and the victors had to leave Versailles empty-handed. At the end of the war, the rest of the mighty German fleet was disbanded under the terms of the armistice, allowing her to keep only a few minor ships for coastal defense. Any new ships built were to be restricted in size. Thus, any navy that Germany had would be far smaller than that of any other countries. When the Second World War came, the part played by sea power was not so different from the part played during the 1914-18 conflict. Its prime role remained in securing the oceans and denying them to the opposing fleets in order to ensure that the maritime communications could be maintained. Thus, navies were still centered around the battle fleets, and at the outbreak of war, the battleships remained their primary vessel. In the build-up to the war, Hitler had ordered that the German Navy be strong enough to challenge the British and embarked on a major construction program. In contradiction to this plan, Grand Admiral Erich Raeder, the naval commander-in-chief, felt that such a plan would be hopeless and that Germany could never match the strength of the Royal Navy on the surface. Instead, he opted for a plan of U-boat construction to cut Britain's maritime lines. The German naval expansion program, Plan Z, therefore represented a compromise. There would be some new battleships and also a major refit of the existing fleet. But by 1939, the British Royal Navy was still the largest in the world. With its empire colonies, it had bases all over the globe. They hoped to draw the German Navy into battle and destroy them. At the opening of the Polish campaign, the first battleship to see action was the Schleswig-Holstein. She was the last of the pre-dreadnought battleships, and by the outbreak of war, was considered almost obsolete. She had been deployed in the Polish campaign and was used extensively to bombard the port areas, such as here in the port of Danzig.
the ship had sailed into the port with stormtroops hidden below decks. During the attack, the bombardment lasted all day and continued through the night. The Polish port, which was being used as an ammunition depot, was heavily defended. Finally, after a very gallant defense, the Poles capitulated. Her task completed, the Schleswig-Holstein moved out into the Gulf of Danzig to continue bombarding other shore defenses at Oxhoft and Hela and Heisternest, where she was joined by her sister ship, the Schleisten. that he would withdraw from Poland, provided that he was allowed to retain Danzig and the Polish corridor. Rader was wary of having to confront the might of the Royal Fleet too soon, and warned Hitler repeatedly that the German Navy was not yet ready to face them. On the 3rd of September, he was called to the Reich Chancellery and informed that in response to the invasion of Poland, Britain had declared war on Germany. Hitler repeatedly assured Raider that this wouldn't happen, but was forced to concede apologetically. I was not able to avoid war with England after all. Raider observed bluntly, the surface forces are so inferior in numbers to those of the British fleet that, even at full strength, they can do no more than show that they know how to die gallantly. The Admiral Graf Spee was the third of Germany's pocket battleships, but was to become the most famous. On the 13th of December 1939, while raiding merchant ships in the South Atlantic Ocean, she was challenged off Montevideo by the British cruisers Ajax, Achilles and Exeter. The battle that followed highlighted the fundamental weakness of the Panzerschiff concept, for the Admiral Graf Spee was not fast enough to dodge the faster cruisers, and her triple 11-inch turrets could not cope with the three fast-moving targets. Although she crippled the Exeter, the Admiral Graf Spee was damaged in the fighting and was forced to put into Montevideo Harbor for repairs. skillful bluffing by the British created the impression that powerful forces were close at hand. Langsdorf was instructed by Hitler to avoid the humiliation of the surrendering of his ship. So on the 17th of December, the ship was scuttled in Uruguayan territorial waters. Under the captaincy of Langsdorf, the Admiral Graf Spee sank nine ships, totaling over 50,000 tons. Not a single civilian, officer, seaman, or passenger lost their lives at his hands. In a last letter, written moments before he took his life, he revealed, a captain with a sense of honor cannot separate his own fate from that of his ship, and I can only prove by my death that the fighting services of the Third Reich were ready to die for the honor of the flag. The Scharnhorst was launched on the 3rd of October, 1936. This fast and robust vessel weighed 32,000 tons. Her sister ship, the Gneisenau, was launched two months later. These two new ships gave a new slant to the definition of a battleship by sacrificing armor plating to secure high speed. These two ships spent the first part of the war attacking merchant shipping convoys in the North Atlantic. In November 1939, they intercepted a convoy off the coast of Iceland, escorted by the armed merchant cruiser, Roel Pindi. She engaged the Scharnhorst immediately. In the exchange that followed, she was sunk but her sacrifice enabled the convoy to escape. The Scharnhorst and the Gneisenau gave further British battleships the slip, 
and return safely to port in Wilmshaven. The goal of the whole business was a trade war. We were not the first battleship in the Atlantic. The Panzerschiffs, which were later renamed the Admiral Scheer and the Graf Spee, had already been active before us. The Scheer was our example, as it had been very successful and we were ordered to carry out our attacks using the same methods. This meant to set sail and find as many convoys and merchant ships as possible and to either destroy them or capture them and bring them back to port. Well, the British had already added armored merchant ships to their convoys as protection and these were armed and sometimes they were protected with battleships or cruisers. We wouldn't always risk going into battle against a ship which may have had better armament than ours. This could have had severe consequences. This would only result in us losing our ship or bringing them back battle damaged and this would have taken us out of the war either for good or whilst being repaired. We had many ships around us in our battle fleets, which were used for reconnaissance. We also had our aircraft. These would search the seas for the convoys, and in particular those without escorts, although sometimes the merchant ships were disguised and had hidden guns. Unfortunately, most of the ships or convoys that were sailing without escorts were ships that were not carrying any significant or important loads, or were empty. But that didn't stop us. Before we would engage and start to shoot, we would always give the convoy the opportunity to stop and surrender. We attacked the ones which hoisted the war flag or sent out Morse or radio signals for help. We did capture quite a few ships. Most times we operated independently. In fact, both the Scharnhorst and the Gneisenau acted independently of each other. But both ships came under the direct orders of the battle fleet commander. Although we were in the same fleet, we rarely came into contact, unless it was to receive new orders concerning posts or reconnaissance areas. During the campaign in the Atlantic, we were at sea for nine weeks. On the 7th of April 1940, Britain's Royal Air Force spotted German merchant ships steaming north towards Norway. They were headed for the ports of Narvik and Trondheim. Each of the ships, disguised as coal ships, were packed with stormtroopers and assault troops. Germany was about to invade Norway. Amongst the fleet were the battleships Scharnhorst and Gneisenau. There were also two-thirds of Germany's U-boat fleet deployed to protect the troop ships. Although being spotted by the RAF, fog and low cloud had helped to mask the ships, and although the British home fleet had been alerted, they were slow to respond to the possible threat. The convoys reached their destinations relatively unhindered, although one of the merchant ships had been sunk by a Polish submarine. One British destroyer, which had also managed to intercept the fleet, was rammed by the German cruiser Hipper, which sent her to the bottom of the North Sea. German seaborne troops made five separate landings in Norway, at Oslo, Christiansand, Bergen, Trondheim and Narvik, whilst airborne troops seized the airfield at Stavanger. Apart from the loss of the Blücher, all other German objectives were taken with relatively little resistance from the Norwegians. However, by the time of the invasion on the 9th of April, the British home fleet had almost caught up with the German fleet, and whilst the troops were being landed safely, there were soon to be ferocious battles going on at sea. Both German and British losses were going to be heavy. We were on the occupation of Norway, which took place in April 1940. Normally, we would hear rumors which would spread over the ship before any orders came. 
But this time, most of us were taken completely by surprise when the order was given. We just set sail all of a sudden with hardly any warning given. All of the ships were fully loaded and we had a fleet of destroyers with us. These destroyers were packed full of ammunition, lances and equipment. We sailed up the coast of Norway and then en route we were told that our destination was to be Narvik. Our job was to travel with the destroyers to the port, protect them whilst they went in and the troops disembarked and all of the ammunition and equipment was unloaded and then protect them on the way out again. The journey up was pretty rough. There was a gale blowing and the seas were running high. It was worse for the destroyers. It got so rough at one point that equipment was falling overboard. And not just equipment, some men went overboard as well. It was that rough. Well, we finally took the destroyers in to Narvik and they unloaded. Whilst we were waiting for them to come back out, we were attacked. It was early morning and still dark, and the British fleet had caught up with us. The battleship Renown, we fought with her for about two hours. The Gneisenau was also involved. We managed to get away and sailed towards our destroyers as we had to get them out safely. However, we heard that it would no longer be necessary as the British had caught them on the way out and they were all lost. The missions we were on during the Norwegian campaign, and I did five more of these, usually lasted about a week. Sometimes they would last three weeks and the longest one we did lasted for nine weeks, which is a long time on the Atlantic. We sailed 18,000 nautical miles. Life on board could be difficult at times, but being seamen, we were used to living in small cramped spaces, and we were perhaps better off being on a big battleship rather than on one of the smaller ships. Most Germans like to eat potatoes. And it's funny, but that's what I missed most of all. Of course, it would have been impossible to carry enough potatoes on board to last 2,000 men for nine weeks. There would have been no room left for anything else. We had a good crew and the officers and rankings were all very fair. Of course, we always moaned about the boss, but without someone in charge, it is impossible to run a ship. There was never any question when orders were given, you just carried on your duty. But quite often the job was not easy. At sea there would always be what we called a war guard. There was a war guard for both cruise stations and the guns where I was. A starboard guard and a backboard guard. There would also always be a guard on duty guarding the ammunition and machines. We all joined in with this duty and took turns on a rotor. On some occasions we were all on duty all of the time, so there was little time for recreation or resting. I also remember when I was on guard duty, I would have to eat my meals at my post. Sometimes this war guard would be halved. Then there were only four of us. So we could take shorter duties and have time to rest. This was usually when the weather was good and we could see more. There was also a night guard on the guns. This was usually the middle gunners and during the daytime the heavy guns. This ensured that we had our guns manned and operational 24 hours a day and could act immediately. The worst time for us was when we were out in the North Sea, out in the real cold, icy conditions. The cold made everything difficult and the conditions were hard. It wasn't the same for the rest of the crew on board, because when the ship was cruising, there was heating, except for the towers where we were. They had nothing.
We used to borrow electrical heaters from wherever we could find them. But this was not possible out on a rough sea. So we usually ended up standing for hours on duty in freezing cold. This type of work is no piece of cake, let me assure you. In June 1940, the Scharnhorst and the Gneisenau were sent north with an order to carry out an attack in the north of Norway. The Norwegian campaign was drawing to a close. With the evacuation of Allied troops from Narvik, Germany now had a strong foothold on the whole country. The German fleet were intending to intercept the ships carrying the retreating Allied forces. En route, the German cruiser, Prince Eugen, engaged one of the empty British transport ships which was en route to Narvik, but had allowed an accompanying hospital ship to continue its journey. The British home fleet had deployed some of its capital ships to the area for protection, including the aircraft carrier HMS Glorious. The Scharnhorst in Gneisenau spotted the smoke cloud from the Glorious at a distance of about 30 kilometers. Accompanying the carrier were British destroyers. The two German battleships moved in to engage the British. From a distance of 29 kilometers, the Scharnhorst opened fire. The German gunnery was efficient and effective, and within minutes, the Glorious took a direct hit. She started to burn, which meant that she could no longer launch her aircraft. The two destroyers accompanying the carrier moved in close to protect her and opened fire on the German ships. The distance between the opposing forces was by now closing. As the Glorious began to sink, the two destroyers fought a fierce battle. However, the first one was soon sunk. The second one, the Ardent, was hit and sunk, but not before letting loose four torpedoes. The Scharnhorst took a direct hit on the starboard side, gouging a hole four meters by 10 meters under one of the main towers. The ship was severely damaged. We didn't know quite how much until later, but we did know it was serious. The middle engine had been damaged and flooded, and the turbine was no longer working. Fortunately, we did manage to get to Trondheim with just one engine, but we could hear the main shaft knocking loudly, and we only just made it. Following a period of repair at Brest, the Scharnhorst and the Gneisenau, along with the Prince Eugen and accompanying destroyers, were to make one of the most dramatic breakouts of the war. They boldly sailed at full speed through the English Channel. After the ship had been in Brest for repairs, we had new orders. The trade war in the Atlantic was becoming increasingly difficult, and whilst we were holed up in Brest, we knew that we were in range of the British bombers, and they knew we were there. It was necessary for the whole fleet to break out before we were attacked. There were three options open to us as we could see it. We could either sail to the Mediterranean, going via Denmark, or we could try and sail up past Norway, back to the safety of the Bay of Germany. Or we could dash out through the English Channel, and this seemed the best option. The British, however, were expecting this, and did everything they could to make the Channel 
impossible. However, we took the chance, and much to the disbelief of the British, we made a dash from the harbor. There was an attack from the bombers, but it was a cloudy night, and they were not successful in stopping us. Somehow we were just very lucky. And it was not until we got to the most narrow point in the channel at Dover, Calais, that we were spotted again. They attacked us with their land battery. But this was no good, as we were just out of range of their guns. Then the aircraft arrived. All around us, the Scharnhorst, the Gneisenau, Prince Eugen, and our destroyers and torpedo aircraft, we were all shooting like mad. The British also sent some torpedo aircraft. These approached us very bravely and made a gallant effort to attack us. But they were too slow. They didn't get a chance to fire one torpedo. We shot down every one of them with our anti-aircraft batteries. By this time, luck was once again on our side. The Luftwaffe arrived and kept the British fighters and bombers busy and shot down many of the RAF aircraft. All of our ships managed to break out of the channel undamaged. The Scharnhorst continued for the next two years plaguing Allied shipping, but in December 1944, her end was in sight. During the Battle of the North Cape, she was engaged and sunk by British cruisers, and only 36 of her crew survived. On the 14th of February, 1939, the massive hull of an unfinished German warship slid into the water at Hamburg. The Bismarck. For the Nazi party, this was a day to celebrate the new might of German war power. A moment that was enjoyed by the Fuhrer himself. This was to be one of the strongest, largest, most powerful and most modern battleships of all the world's navies. However, the legend of the Bismarck is one that spans a mere 277 days, only 277 days from its launching to its sinking. And yet the gigantic Bismarck was responsible for one of the most gripping dramas to take place at sea during World War II. During that short span of time, it was the most powerful battleship in the world. On board was the most up-to-date and most superior technology available. Its massive array of weapons and the extremely high level of its crew's training made this ship a seemingly invincible war machine. The sea power of the Bismarck now stood between Germany and victory, and no navy in the world had ever engaged an enemy warship like her. Just before the summer of 1940, I was ordered to the battleship Bismarck. We spent the next few weeks getting to know the ship inside out, learning where everything was and how the ship ran. Next, we were allocated to our positions. I was ordered to join the 15-inch artillery, the middle artillery, and I was trained how to use the guns and how to work the ammunition chamber and all aspects of this station. And then we set sail. 
We were ordered to run a series of tests and trials for the new ship in the Baltic Sea. Our job was checking the guns, calibration and firing with blanks. With practice and getting to know the guns, we managed to achieve a salvo rate one round every six seconds. Considering the size of our heavy artillery, this was pretty good. The British had been waiting for the Bismarck to make its move, and as the mighty battleship slid past the coastline of Norway, she was spotted. A signal was transmitted to the Admiralty Building in London. A Royal Air Force reconnaissance aircraft was sent to confirm the sighting. The aerial photographs were sent back to London, and the sighting was confirmed. It was definitely the Bismarck. She was lying at anchor, hidden in deep fog in a fjord, whilst her accompanying ships took on fuel. Nobody on board knew that we had been spotted by the Royal Air Force. And consequently, we were unaware that Britain knew we were coming. Air Force, and the Meldung war schon lange in England, we were ausgelaufen sind. We sailed into the Denmark Strait on the 22nd, and this was when we had the first encounter with two British cruisers. All of a sudden, these two British cruisers came out of the fog. We were given permission to open fire. But then the two cruisers disappeared again into the fog, so we couldn't see them to hit them with our guns. The British also had radar, just as we did. And here, the commander of our fleet made a mistake. He assumed that the cruisers hadn't seen us visually and that although their radar beams might have hit our ship, they did not reflect back to the British cruisers, as this type of radar was ineffective at this time. This belief, however, was incorrect. The British cruisers, Suffolk and Norfolk, had seen Bismarck accompanied by the Prince Eugen and already knew her whereabouts from the previous signal. The new position was transmitted back to London. As Bismarck continued, a message was sent to the battleship Hood, giving them coordinates and orders to intercept and engage the Bismarck. The Hood at this time was Britain's capital ship and most closely comparable to Bismarck. Although aging, she was still the most powerful ship in the Royal Navy and was considered to be a worthy adversary of the Bismarck. The Hood, together with the Prince of Wales and six destroyers, set off to cut off the enemy at the Denmark Strait. The ships closed fast on each other and prepared to do battle. In the first exchange, the Hood and the Prince of Wales opened fire with the Bismarck and Prince Eugen returning fire immediately. In the first minute, a shell from the Prince Eugen hit the Hood, starting a fire which rapidly spread forward, setting the whole ship ablaze. A huge explosion followed moments later. The Hood sank within minutes, having only fired five or six salvos in the whole exchange. Of its crew of over 1,400 men, only three survived. With the Hood destroyed, the Bismarck and Prince Eugen turned their guns on the Prince of Wales. She was also hit and forced to break off any further offensive action. After the appalling loss of the Hood, the Bismarck and Prince Eugen endeavored to make good their escape. But the captain of the Prince of Wales faced difficult decisions. She was a new ship with many teething problems still to be ironed out. There were many casualties and her bridge was seriously damaged. She eventually retired to Iceland and refueled, though unknown to her, 
she had hit the Bismarck, causing a major oil leak and making her intended foray into the Atlantic impossible. Well, we had taken three hits against the hood. One in the engine room, one in the front of the ship, and one in the launch position. One of the crew had died in the battle. We sailed a bit further, and then it was decided that the Prince Eugen should carry on towards Greenland. And we, the Bismarck, would try to make a dash to Brest for repairs. The problem we had was that the welded seam between the backboard and the second boiler room was seriously damaged and water was coming in. We were all on the alert and were kept very busy. When water comes into a ship, as you can imagine, this is the worst that can happen. People start to panic. Later, after this, things started to settle down and we went back to our normal combat posts and the ship steamed on. Later that day, Bismarck was attacked by aircraft from the new carrier Victorious. One hit was obtained but caused little damage. The German ships separated and the whereabouts of Bismarck became unknown. But for the British, the hunt was on. Catalinas took off to join in the search. As the Catalina scoured the ocean, there came a break in the clouds and the telltale wake of a ship was spotted. As the ship came into view, the signal was flashed back to the fleet. The target had been sighted. Within minutes, the Ark Royal, together with the Force H, drew close and reported the position. The weather was particularly bad in the vicinity of the target, but the crews were told no other ship was in the area. The order was flashed to the Sheffield to find and shadow the Bismarck. The Ark Royal never noticed her departure. The aircraft of the Ark Royal, flying in difficult conditions, picked up a ship on their radar, roughly in the position where the Bismarck was expected. Assuming it to be the Bismarck, they pressed their attack, but on the Sheffield. But fortune was turning against the Bismarck. On board the Ark Royal, the returning aircraft were rearmed and refueled. In heavy rain, the swordfish took off for the second attack. Without doubt, this would be the last chance to stop Bismarck's escape. Rear Admiral P.D. Gick was one of the swordfish pilots who flew against the Bismarck. We went in using the ASV, which we had in that squadron. To our amazement, all the gun farms bursting right out ahead of us. Provided you could convince yourself that these black blobs weren't going to hurt you, we didn't worry. And we discovered afterwards that the Germans were so convinced that no aircraft could possibly fly slower than 100 knots that their gun control organization had that as their minimum speed. We climbing were doing 75, flat out doing 80. So we were completely out of harm. It was a bit of luck, really. On the 26th in the evening, we were attacked for the first time by the British swordfish, the torpedo aircraft. Later in the night, a second attack came, and this time they were more successful. We got hit. We had tried to evade the aircraft and torpedoes, but on this time we took a hit in the rudder. It was badly damaged. It was bent about 12 degrees. And after this, we could only sail about eight miles straight with the help of the engines working against the rudder. 
we were helpless. We must have been about six hours ahead of the British fleet. But because we could not escape, only go in large circles, they caught up with us. At about 6 a.m., they caught us. We tried to accelerate away, but it was useless. We could only travel in a circle, about a 12-degree radius. It wasn't long before we all realized that we had become a sitting target for the British fleet. Steaming helplessly in circles, the Bismarck was engaged the following morning by the British fleet, being hit repeatedly by the battleships Rodney and King George V. We took two direct hits on the front of the ship. The tower crew came up top and warned us to get away as quickly as possible, as the tower was about to explode at any minute. The ship's guard sounded the order for the crew to retreat. We ran back to the part of the ship where our quarters were. We were below deck. There was panic everywhere. The crew from the operating rooms, the ones that manned the boilers and turbines, had been given the signal, Measure V. The V meant versunken, sinking. We had 15 minutes to abandon ship. I tried to open the hatchway. This was impossible because the flax had fallen on top of it. I shouted out for someone above to try and move them, which luckily somebody did hear, and they were moved. I let the other comrades out first and made sure the room was clear. Then there was another direct hit on the deck. We lost so many men, and many more were badly injured. Then I managed to get to the backboard side. This was a mistake on my part. The water was pouring in. I had to pull myself up higher out of the water and get to the next level up the ship. You cannot imagine or believe what I saw. I was on the deck in front of the Caesar Tower. There were at least 50, probably more like 100 dead bodies. You just cannot imagine such a sight. Reducing the Bismarck to a flaming shambles, the Rodney and King George V had to urgently retire due to an acute shortage of fuel and Bismarck's final destruction was left to the cruiser Dorchester. In all, 111 men from the Bismarck were saved, but almost 2,000, including all her officers, had perished. It was an enormous relief to the Royal Navy that the Bismarck had been sunk, not least that the loss of the pride of the fleet, the Hood, had been avenged. The first Lord of the Admiralty, A.V. Alexander, went on board the Rodney to address her ship's company. The destruction of the Bismarck, that great and powerful ship, had to be accomplished through the traditions of the British Royal Navy, because in the Navy, I know officers and men know how to avenge the loss of those who are comrades, and many of whom have been shipmates. Three cheers for the first Lord of the Admiralty. Hip, hip, hip. Hooray! The Lutza was launched under the name Deutschland. But in February 1940, Hitler decided that the loss of a ship called after Germany would be a bad omen. So the name was then changed to the Lutza. 
In 1940, she took part in the Norwegian campaign before sailing further north to threaten Allied convoys to Russia. In December 1940, she and the Admiral Hipper took part in a raid against a convoy defended by eight destroyers. The destroyers put up a formidable defense in what became known as the Battle of the Barents Sea. Finally, the battleships were forced to abandon the raid. Hitler was furious at such a disappointing performance and threatened to disband the Navy altogether. Relations between the Führer and his Grand Admiral had reached breaking point. Reda resigned and was replaced by Admiral Dönitz. The Lutzau was sent to the Baltic for training duty, but later operated as support for the army against the Russians in the Eastern Baltic. Two months after the Bismarck had been launched, her sister ship, the Tirpitz, had rolled down the slipway. At 52,600 tons, the Tirpitz was 2,000 tons heavier than the Bismarck and had a larger armament and crew. She had been deployed to Norway in 1942. The numerous fjords gave her plenty of relatively safe anchorages. In September 1943, British midget submarines known as X-Craft had managed to get into her fjord and damaged the turpits with limpet mines, although all of the X-Craft were lost in the process. Bomber Command was next to attack the turpits. September 15, 22 lakhs of bomber command, carrying 12,000 pound tall boy bombs, attacked the 45,000 ton German battleship Tirpitz at her anchorage in Car Fjord. On the run up, small amounts of low cloud made bombing difficult, and a huge smoke screen, put into operation not more than eight minutes before the attack, soon obscured the target. The Lancasters flew from a Russian base to make this attack, which was carried out from between 13,500 and 17,500 feet. smoke screen covering not only the turpits but all the surrounding area. In this attack the battleship received a direct hit forward on the starboard side. Once again the turpits was damaged but once again, not significantly. So Bomber Command was forced to continue further raids against her. On October 29, Lancasters of Bomber Command carried out their second attack on the battleship Tirpitz, which had been moved to Tromso Fjord after the attack on September 15, when a direct hit was scored with a 12,000 pound bomb. The cloud in the area made the bomber's task very difficult on this occasion, and strong opposition came from the battleship. On November 12, 29 Lancasters with 12,000 pound bombs carried out the third and last attack on the Tirpitz. On this occasion, the weather was clear. As the aircraft went into attack, all the guns of the great ship blazed away, but to no avail. Two or three direct hits were scored. Shortly after the attack, the battleship capsized. Now the Tirpitz was sunk, Germany had lost her most important remaining battleship. During the course of the war, the Royal Navy had fought a long, hard, chivalrous war against the might of Germany's capital ships. But by war's end, the importance of the battleship had diminished with the rise of the aircraft carrier, her role eventually being reduced to little more than that of carrier escort. <laughs> 